But I thought I could either be in the shower with a bunch of dudes, yeah. or I can be in the dressing room with a bunch of girls. Yeah. I thought I would <laughs> rather be in the dressing room with a bunch of girls. So it, it was just as simple as that. I did some wild stuff in mm -hmm. auditions, yeah. attempting to sort of distinguish myself or create a voice or experiment with the, the medium itself. I saw the scripts and I saw that they were trying to be funny mm -hmm. and they weren't. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anything in the script. I just started doing whatever I thought was funny. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I put the wig on, he was just like, hey man, what are you doing? That doesn't look right, you know? And I was like, no, this will be okay. I need to show them a different look. And he's like, that's not, so when I realized sort of how bad it looked, I was like, no, I'm leaning into this. Uh, but what I am saying is that when people are crafting their auditions, that's the time to exercise your creativity. Mm -hmm. If you're not having fun in a demoralizing business, yeah. it's brutal. Let's try this. Let's, yeah. let's make him like a really intense bureaucrat. Let's make him like a rule follower. Mm -hmm. Let's make him like he's ambitious and wants to do something with his career. Mm -hmm. He really thinks he's bringing law and order to the savages out here in wilds, right? Yeah. And he was like, all right, try that. That character over enunciates mm -hmm. and tries to be proper all of the time. Yeah, yeah, and you know, all of that stuff. Like, and then of course, because it's a video game and people fight and die, I'm screaming all day, right? So I get to die by getting dunked in acid. I get to die by getting burned to death. I get to die by being frozen to death. I get to die by being hypnotized to death, right? I get to die by getting cut in half with a laser. So it's a whole lot of screaming. I went to the voice doctor and he said, your throat is bleeding. Um, and it, that's the bad news. The good news is it's bleeding everywhere, which means you're not misusing your voice. I already punish myself so much, no matter what anyone said could hurt me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you can't hate me more than I already hate myself. I started on this journey because a very wise person uh, said that the mask I'm wearing can fool everyone, but it doesn't fool him. Mm. That he sees the, the, the darkness underneath and it's a matter of time before it wins. Mm. I'm Ajay Rogozin and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals oh, and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? <laughs> and how can you start doing the same thing? And my guest today is an American actor, voice actor, writer and producer. He is Quintus on The Chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, he played the role of Dale in Little Woods. He worked on such video games as Borderlands 2 and 3 and Dragon Ball Z, among others. Mm -hmm. And if you watch anime in English, his voice can be heard in such projects as One Piece, Cool Rumble, and much, much more. And finally, finally, uh, the most important project of all is the Inside Man, where we met, because I'm on it, it's all about me. <laughs> no, it's not. That's right, that's right, of course. <laughs> no, uh, Brandon Potter. Mm -hmm. Hey man. That's me. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing? good. Thank you for being here. Uh, just so you know, we are actually filming now. We're in Birmingham mm -hmm. and we're filming the Inside Man season six. It's my first day for you. It was probably quite uh, a lot of Yeah. So I was here maybe two weeks ago for about three weeks mm -hmm. uh, and we did a good bit of the shooting then. Then I went back to the States for two weeks right, and yeah. I'm, I got back in Sunday. Nice. Today is Tuesday, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, did you shoot yesterday? No, no, no. Yeah. I'll shoot today and then tomorrow. Yeah, same for me. And then uh, I'm off this uh, season. Uh, are you going to Europe? Yeah. Yeah. Later. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're, we're doing some stuff in Romania. I, I think we have one day in Berlin. I'm pretty sure it's just an exterior shot <laughs> of me walking into a building. <laughs> so I think I get I get paid to go to Berlin to to walk into a building, which is they could have done them green screen. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, look, um, uh, I usually start with you know how you got into into this mm -hmm. uh, but with you I want to start a little bit earlier and talk about your childhood because you are from Texas Weatherford Weatherford Texas that's yeah, right which is yeah. not a huge city I think it's like no. around 30,000 that's right yeah and when I was growing up it was even smaller I think when I was growing up it was maybe something like 14,000 and you know I'm from Eastern Europe uh, I think most of my listeners are from UK there are some people from the US but you know for me it's interesting because I know America from the movies. 
and series and all this stuff because, well, we all know that the first city that's being attacked by aliens is New York or Washington. <laughs> that's always always the case. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what like America I know, and I have been to to the U.S. two times for work, uh, and it was uh, L.A. and New York again, sure. like huge cities, but. I'm like I'm very curious about like how was life, especially back in the days, in like those smaller cities. Like how how was your childhood? Oh man, that's a yeah, that's a that, that's a question right there. <laughs> so Weatherford was a small town, yeah. and um, I think there was kind of an ideal amongst people at the time where like a small town would be sort of where you raise your mm -hmm. kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a family friendly, yeah, 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 a wholesome American value sort of place, and. Um, that I think was sort of true, mm. you know, um, whether it has problems like any small town that, you know, there were things like, like the, the meth problem was big, uh, uh, you know, in small towns at the mm. time. And, it, it, you know, there's another thing in small towns, which is that they, they don't provide just a whole lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. small towns. So it might've been a good place to grow up, but it was a tough place to be a grown yeah. up or yeah. find your place yeah. in the world because there was an access to a lot of stuff there. Fortunately, we were close enough to Dallas and Fort Worth, which are sort of like, they're like a, in Texas, they're sort of like one giant city, these two mm -hmm. cities. So there sort of was a big city close by, but as a teenager, mm -hmm. 30 miles might as well be 3000 miles. Yeah, you can't course. get there, <laughs> you know? Um, it was a, it was a place where growing up, I never thought, that I would be here doing this thing with you, mm -hmm. right? That's not something I could have pictured. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I was pretty certain that I was going to, so for example, my first like job job there was digging water wells, mm -hmm. right? So manually when working on farms, things yeah. like that. And I worked for my dad. My dad worked uh, at a funeral home and it was a small town. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, your kids are kind of part of the workforce there, yeah. right? So I would go and make calls with him. Um, uh, as he worked at the funeral home. So all of that is to say, I sort of thought that I would either follow my dad's footsteps mm -hmm. and work at a funeral home. If he started his own funeral home, then perhaps I would have yeah, like a, yeah. a shoe in to be a funeral director there, or I would get some sort of technical certification, like working on air conditioning or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of always what I thought, even though I loved doing this thing, which was acting. Yeah. I wasn't sure that being an actor was possible, mm -hmm. right? Because coming from a small town and thinking yeah. that I was just going to be a, a, a thing, I was going to be a tradesman like my like my mm -hmm. dad. In high school, I high school is like a ninth grade or about fourteen years old. Mm -hmm. um, I got into a school play, yeah, and. Uh, the reason I got into the school play was because the school system wasn't very big, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, you have to choose electives. Mm -hmm. And there were kind of two choices. There was theater or football, right? Yeah. And I, I thought like... And by football... Uh, I mean American, American football. football. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, right, I am an American. Um, <laughs> so it, it was those two choices. And I sort of thought about it for a second when I was choosing my classes. And I thought, I, I can either be... Uh, sorry if this sounds <laughs> glib or coarse or whatever, but I thought I could either be in the shower with a bunch of dudes yeah. or I can be in the dressing room with a bunch of girls. Yeah. And I thought <laughs> I would rather be in the dressing room with a bunch of girls. So it, it was just as simple as that. So I got into this theater class and I started doing plays there, you know, and we had this sort of tiny theater department. It was very popular. American football is king in high school, right? Especially in small town Texas, especially for... Uh, 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 a young man, right? A guy, you're supposed to be into that. Which is like, as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, like, especially like in Texas and in America, sports, like football and just sports in general, it's like a ticket to life for, for a lot of like teenager. Definitely. Sports, for for yeah. a lot of people, like that's their shot out yeah. of like the small town or that's their yeah. shot out of rural life or, mm -hmm. or poverty or whatever. Yeah. Um, for most people, it isn't that. But mm -hmm. e even if it's that's not your your ticket out of the small town, it's still your ticket into all of the sort of like social, social gatherings yeah, and yeah, clubs yeah. and social life and all, all of that stuff. And I I, I wasn't really plugged into that. Mm -hmm. But I did do this. I did do this play. And in this play, keep in mind, I was a fourteen year old boy, mm -hmm. right? Everyone else in the cast was double cast, meaning 
in order for to get everyone into the play, yeah. two people play one role on different nights, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone was double cast except for me. Yeah. And my character got to kiss three girls in one show, which means that I got to kiss six girls doing this one play. Yeah. Which to a 14 year old boy is six, six mind goes more than a year before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, they, because I was a freshman, and all yeah. the girls in the play were uh, were seniors. Yeah. So I was kissing girls who were much older than me. I yeah. was fourteen. I was kissing girls who were eighteen, mm -hmm. which I'm sure was repulsive for them, but was very, very exciting to oh, me. Of course, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so when that happened, I thought, you know, maybe I'm going to be a funeral director like my dad, or maybe I'm going to work on air conditioners, or continue to work on farms, or. But I can do as much of this in the meantime, because mm -hmm. this is fun. So mm -hmm. I'll do as much of this until I eventually have to get a real job. And for my adolescence, that's what I did. I just tried to cram as much of that in because I knew that I was going to have this, this life that wasn't, that it, it, to my mind, it didn't seem as fun, mm -hmm. right? Sooner or later, I'm going to have to join the real world. Yeah. So I did as much as I could. So I went to gosh, like a junior college, mm. uh, which is like a two-year college. It's like a local college. Yeah. Um, so I went to a junior college and I got a scholarship for theater. And then I went to go work at a theater in a small, another small town in Texas called Victoria. Mm. And I built the sets and uh, taught kids and was in the plays. And eventually I figured I had to go to college. Mm. Um, and these were the days when uh, the grownups were telling kids that if you got any college degree, you would be set, mm -hmm. right? It didn't matter what degree it was. Uh, you just needed a degree and then you could get a good job. And I thought, well, if it doesn't matter what degree you get, then I should get a theater degree because that's the funnest. And maybe they'll let me kiss more girls, right? <laughs> so I went to a school in Texas called the University of Texas in Austin. And I somehow completed a four-year degree there. Mm. Um, and I was still doing theater. And when I it came time to graduate and I was like, all right, time to get a real job. Yeah. So I got out of school and I thought, all right, time to get a real job. So I applied for a job at a video store that my friend was working at. <laughs> Maybe not exactly a, a real job, real enough for you know, a 22 year old. And I done with school and I applied for this job. And one of my friends said, before you sign up for that, you should you should do an, you should do an audition at this place I've been working at called Funimation. Funimation was dubbing Dragon Ball Z at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to a big cattle call audition and the cattle call auditions were like hundreds of people show up to be background actors, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I went to this cattle call audition and I ended up getting one of the leads in a really small anime dubbing it. Right. So for a little bit of reference, Dubbing anime now is seen as like a, a, a kind of legitimate form of acting, right? Mm -hmm. Anime is very popular now. Yeah. So people, they love it now, yeah. right? It's mainstream. Yeah. But when I was doing this, this is 20 years ago. This was for nerds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most of them, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like a lot of people who actually watch anime, they like a lot of real fans like otaku or whatever they kind of they prefer to watch it actually in original with, yes. with subtitles yeah, yeah. that's right yeah. so even according to the nerds we were not doing the real yeah. thing right <laughs> so other actors thought that we were like not really being able to make it as actors yeah. and even our audiences were like this isn't even the real thing yeah. so it was not a cool thing to do yeah. but you got something like i don't remember what it was it was like I think we started out at maybe like $25 an hour or something mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, you, you could work for, you could have an eight hour day. You know? Well, to be fair, like $25 or $5 an hour, it's not bad, especially back in the days. It's no. actually pretty good. No, it's yeah. not bad. It, especially, yeah, I, I, I had been, I was used to working for like $7 an hour, yeah. right? So this was, this. so I ended up getting this thing. And because that community was so small, because it wasn't really popular back then, mm -hmm. I ended up getting some more gigs just because I was already in the studio, right? They'd be like, well, Brandon's already here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he can sound like an old guy. Or Brandon's already here. I think he can, he can do it. So just bring him in. So that ended up building a lot of momentum over the next few years so that I, I started writing the, the English versions mm -hmm. of the scripts. 
Um, so I would get a Japanese translation, then I would make it sort of fit what was going on on screen. Well, can you explain to me this process? So, for example, first of all, where did you get translations? So you had people who actually translated. Yeah, there so translation. you, First of all, you didn't have Google Translate back then. No. And no, no, no. even if you did, it no. wouldn't work. We all know it doesn't work properly. So there were kind of a few steps to this process. Mm -hmm. So we would get rough translations and they hired translators, the companies who were like licensing this material essentially. Mm -hmm. So at the time Funimation was hiring translators who would give us essentially a literal word for word translation. Yeah. And things are lost in translation like idioms mm -hmm. and Japanese don't translate culturally to English. And right? idioms, I think, just in general, like from they any language that don't really work most of the time. Right, and jokes and things mm -hmm. like that, they, they don't really yeah. do the thing. Not to mention, uh, sometimes there'll be a paragraph of uh, Japanese and the mouth movements or flaps, as we call them, only do like three. So then you have to sort of condense all of this mm -hmm. down into the three mm -hmm. mouth movements that it would take to, yeah. to communicate the point in English. Considering all of that, there's a, it's kind of a two-step process. First, you have to time code it, which mm -hmm. means that you get a time coded back in the day. I don't know if this is how they do it anymore, mm -hmm. but you would get a time coded copy and you would pause it and find the exact frame where the mouth movement started. So you would record that time code and then you would look at the Japanese translation, see what it was, and then you'd write the English line for it. And you did that for every for every single line, every instance of a human utterance. How much you time did it take to do that? Uh, beginning, it was very slow and very painstaking, yeah. but eventually you could get pretty good at it. So. Back in the day, they would send you DVDs, these time-coded DVDs, and uh, they would email you a rough translation of this. And then I would sit in front of my computer for probably 10 hours a day, three or four days a week, translating and writing these and yeah. writing these things, um, which was sort of nice because the, the money was okay, but I could do it from anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could... Uh, eventually, I ended up moving to New York, and that job sort of helped pay for my apartment. New York's a very expensive city. Yeah. Um, so that job helped me sort of pay for my place in New York so that I could, I don't know, further explore whatever it was that I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started directing for them as well, directing the the, the, uh, the performances. Yeah. yeah. So I was at, at one point for Funimation, I was writing, directing, mm -hmm. and, and acting, yeah. which gave me a lot of time in the booth. Um, so when I went to New York... Uh, I really? thought that I would go there and find a find a real job. So I got a job. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> so I went up there and I got this. I got this job as like a a writer for an internet upstart. But I was miserable and I was terrible at it. I thought mm. I, I need to make some extra money. Yeah. So I hounded an agent. You know, said so like, dude, I can be and I can do commercials. And he was like, you've never done a commercial. I was like, yeah, but I could do that. You know, what he didn't know was is that at that point. Uh, I had worked at Funimation for maybe like two or three years. So I had spent thousands of hours in a booth. So what he didn't know is I've never, I've never done a commercial before, but I'd spent thousands of hours in a booth at that yeah. point. So maybe not thousands, maybe hundreds, <laughs> millions of hours in a booth. I was a voiceover God. No, no, no. But, but I was experienced enough to of know course. sort of what I was doing. I, and commercial acting is different than dub acting, but but I, I felt like I, if I given a chance, like I could make it work. So I hounded this guy and eventually, uh, I, I, I booked something there and I had to have a long, hard talk with myself, you know, and that talk involved saying like, man, you have more fun doing this other thing. Um, than a real job than a real job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like, I started doing things like eventually I was gone four hours a day trying to go on auditions, I, but I didn't tell my job I was gone. I would just leave. Right. So it was a matter of time before they were going to fire me. Uh, and they did, they did, they fired me. Well, you know, I kind of understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I understand too. And it really was, uh, it really was just a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, so they, they fired me, but I, but I did end up getting, uh, a, a couple of gigs that convinced me that I, I should, this wasn't just a thing I could do during college. I should probably consider this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went to uh, an acting school. Yeah. I, I got a master's degree from a place called Southern Methodist University. Mm -hmm. And that was a three-year program. And at the end of that, I got a membership into a, 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 a regional theater, which in the States, a regional theater would be like, you know, not everywhere. 
it's such a long tribute to New York to Broadway, right? So they sort of have to bring theater to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's the regional theater movement was. So there's like sort of big fancy theaters and like, Minneapolis and Dallas and Houston and Miami's. And I, I ended up working for one of the regional theaters in Texas, a Dallas theater center. And then also the alley theater mm. uh, in Houston as an actor or like everything a little bit. I was an actor there. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was so an actor there. You, you, how, how much of theater you did in general? A lot. Yeah. So, um, in New York, I did a lot of like really, really tiny theater. You know, so when I got there trying to get, trying to be a real person, trying to have a real job, my friends would come and be like, Hey man, you want to be in a play? And I'd be like, no, 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 I can't be in a play. I'm done with all that. And they'd be like, it's just a little part. And I'd be like, all right, I'll do it. You know, a treat. Like that, yeah, 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 exactly. But, uh, when I got to Texas, I did a lot of theater. Um, so I was a full-time company member, which means that I was doing, you know, uh, I guess for a while I was probably doing like three or four plays a year for maybe mm -hmm. like, I was a full-time company member for maybe two or three years and then I was sort of on the menu there which means that I was working like two or three shows a year there mm -hmm. for another three years yeah uh, between Dallas and, and Houston um, and uh, so when you were the, the, those shows like how many how many shows did you have per like run were, were like long runs or mm -hmm. like just few shows like five six no we would run for we would usually run for about six weeks mm -hmm. and for shows like for regular shows we would do I think eight show weeks is mm -hmm. that right is it, is it is it like a fringe theater in in new york no this would be like th this would be like where the city gets its theater so there'd be big uh mainstream okay, shows okay. so it'd be like the music man and true west mm -hmm. which would be shows that you would do at big theaters in, in in the states usually it's something it's not quite as like edgy as a lot of new york theater because you're not going for Uh, an audience that sees theater all the time, right? So you might not do um, very experimental stuff, mm -hmm. but in terms of like budgets and draws, it can be pretty sizable. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes those theaters have operating budgets of, you know, between like 10 and 20 million dollars a year. So yeah, yeah, it's just enough. because it's interesting how different it is for, from London, because I spoke, uh, I, like I did a couple of plays, uh, but it was even, not even like just London fridge, it was London Russian speaking fridge. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit different. Uh, but I spoke to Demi Lay, my friend, uh, on the podcast as well, and like we discussed like fringe theater in London, like it's, it's very different, because usually when you do fringe here, it's like tiny tiny audiences and you do like three four five performances and that's kind of it uh, no for a like, show like christmas also, carol also like theaters in pubs and stuff you know sure yeah, yeah. uh no this is not that i mean the, this was like a big proper theater yeah. christmas carol we do 10 shows a week nice. we do 10 shows a week for nearly two months mm -hmm. so that that's yeah enough <laughs> enough to get comfortable on stage i mm -hmm. guess yeah yeah are, are you uh yeah. yeah yeah like uh are, are you getting nervous when, when you're performing on stage do i get nervous yeah 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 still yeah of course i i think if you did get nervous there'd kind of not be a reason to do it anymore so something wrong right yeah <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes i'm not gonna lie like sometimes it's not there sometimes the nerves aren't there sometimes the excitement isn't there sometimes yeah. it's just like a job i i I remember I was maybe like 80 performances in, which is uh, enough yeah. to start getting antsy. Yeah. And I talked to this guy and he was much more experienced. He had done something like, oh God, he was a role in Lion King for like five years or something like that. So he did the same show every day for five years. And I was talking to him. I said, man, how do you, how do you stay focused? You know? Yeah. And, he, and he gave me this, you know, sort of like, And very inspiring answers. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you just have to reinvest, you know, look at your partner and see the human before them, not the collection of yeah. action and story that you've seen for the last 80, you know, performances. Yeah. Uh, it, and it was really inspiring to me. And then we got further into the run, mm -hmm. you know, e even more performances after that. And I was like, I'm really struggling. He was like, look, man, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes you just got to think about that paycheck, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I loved his honesty in that because yeah. it sort of showed me, I was at that time, I was sort of young and idealistic and thought yeah. that like everyone making art was like super yeah. jazzed the yeah. whole time. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're, sometimes you're, I mean, it's still a job. Yeah, like you're more passionate about this job than like some other jobs, but at sure. the same time, every job at some point, like, gets to a point where it's, 
it's a job I, I gotta do it yeah yeah i would rather stay in bed today but i gotta do it. if my paycheck paycheck didn't depend on it and if i like other people didn't depend on it, i would probably stay in bed today right tomorrow maybe again yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah that, that's that's quite a lot so like you you have uh more experience do you have like do you have more experience in theater than screen Yes, uh, yes, but I think that that's changing, mm-hmm. um, like where I'm sort of at right now. So working on stage is how I made my living for a long yeah. time. I was a, like a union member, which mm-hmm. means that we got like a living wage and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And when the pandemic happened, it, over the course of like two weeks, I got three phone calls that eliminated something like 45 weeks of work, which is that's how I got my insurance, my health insurance in America. We don't have uh, yeah, yeah. free health care. One, one of the things is like every time when I had thought like, should I try it in LA or like, or whatever, like or move somewhere like the, the, your health system is like, it's it bonkers. Me. It scares me. Yeah. It's bonkers. <laughs> um, so that was a really, I, that was when I, I, I tried to apply to other jobs, but no one would hire me because they're, you know, the pandemic was on and a lot of people were, uh, had lost their jobs yeah. and were trying to get out of it. So it was rough. So at that point I decided like, and I hadn't been, I'd taken a little bit of time off of voiceover while I was doing all these plays. Mm. Right. Um, I wasn't doing nearly as much. So it was during that time that I realized that like, and that was gosh, four years ago mm. that I had to do more on screen stuff. So I really leaned into, um, doing commercials right i did a lot of like small yeah. commercials in the states um uh you know uh, corporate videos like what we work on with the inside man mm. and uh eventually i ended up getting some other stuff right yeah. um the the chosen really helped and mm. uh it was a hard time though you mm. know to like decide to make that switch especially given how like competitive everything is and yeah. like people will say things like oh theater actors are too big for screen so which, i had to switch of... always like not always like well, but often it might be true yeah, yeah yeah so i had to sort of like reframe how i thought about performance mm. and what i was doing it for um i got to ex- oh not got to i guess i sort of had to experiment mm-hmm. with auditioning i did some wild stuff in mm-hmm. auditions yeah. attempting to sort of distinguish myself or create a voice or experiment yeah. with the the medium itself mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a strange time but it 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 ended up working what would be the wildest thing that you did that audition <laughs> the the one thing man the wildest thing the wildest thing i You know, the first commercial that I got that really changed things for me on camera, it's where I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I saw the scripts and I saw that they were trying to be funny Mm -hmm. and they weren't. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anything in the script. I just started doing whatever I thought was funny. Yeah. Yeah. I got the, I got the job. Really? Uh, and I got the job they were looking for an older sort of Brian Dennehy type. And I was not that, mm. you know, um, but I just started saying lines that I thought were funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would sort of tag the product at the end. And I got this call back and they're like, what are you doing? You have to say the lines. And I was like, do I? <laughs> and the director said, you know, actually, I kind of liked your joke on the, on this one take. Can yeah. you do that joke? But with the rest of the lines yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. i was like okay yeah <laughs> so i so i ended up getting that that's and bold i thought that there's no way i was going to get this anyway okay yeah, and yeah. i was like bored and frustrated mm-hmm. and i didn't know where everything was going yeah, yeah. I, i was sort of lashing out but once i got that uh gig because i didn't stick to the script this is for commercial not for films yeah, if yeah, martin scorsese sends you an audition say the lines of man course, he's yeah. got them better than you yeah. right but for for, for this It was because I was so frustrated and I was just kind of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what would, what would happen. Yeah. But after I got that part, I started doing that a lot with my commercial auditions, just mm. doing whatever I wanted. At yeah. one time, oh my gosh, this was deep in the pandemic. Uh, everything was shut down. And I don't remember what this, pro- it was, I can't remember what the product was for. But I thought like, okay, everyone needs to see me look different. And I'm, I'm bald, right? That's, mm-hmm. and, and I've always been bald. That's, mm-hmm. this is sort of like, this is how I look, right? Default for you. Yeah, exactly. It suits you. Uh, <laughs> hey, thanks. 
Uh, but I was like, they need to see a different look. So I got to buy a wig. So then, <laughs> but the thing was, I was too broke to get like a, a wig that looked like, that looked like I had hair. Yeah. So I had this sort of like <laughs> crappy wig <laughs> and I showed up to, to audition this thing. I had a friend who was reading with me in the audition and, and I put the wig on. He was just like, Hey man, what are you doing? That doesn't look right. You know? And I was like, no, this will be okay. I need to show them a different look. And he's like, that's not. So when I realized sort of how bad it looked, I was like, no, I'm leaning into this. Uh. So I made this whole spiel in this thing. I was supposed to come on and pitch this product, right? And it was a pretty straightforward pitch. But I gave myself intro music. So, you know, normally when the audition comes up, you know, like, it's just like, you know, you fade in and like, you're there, right? You're like, yeah, I buy the new 99 cent, whatever, you know, like that kind of thing. But I started off screen and I started playing, I I don't think it was the final countdown, but it was Mm -hmm. something like that. So I gave myself intro music. I made an intro, you know, I made an intro onto the frame. And then I, instead of the reader reading the lines, he said, is that a wig? (laughs) And I said, I'm glad you asked. And then I just, then I went straight into the commercial Uh, without ever answering why I was wearing a wig or addressing him at all after that. I just, is that a wig? I'm glad you asked. Anyway, you should buy the new, you know, it was the weirdest thing ever because this wig looked terrible, Andre. It looked awful. Um, but apparently I made the guys uh, in the casting office crack up, of you course. know, and they're yeah. like, we're, we're calling you back for this. Can you prepare the spot this time? You know, <laughs> no wig place. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, I did bring the wig to the, to the job when I got the yeah. job. I was like, you sure you guys don't want, and they're like, yeah, we're sure. We're sure. Um, yeah. So I, I just started doing whatever yeah. it is that, that I wanted to do, uh, or I temporarily lost my mind and for whatever reason, people bought it, you know, it's, one it's or the other. It's interesting, like, would it work here? Because I'm, I'm just curious how different industries in, in the US and in the UK, uh, because obviously, like, they always say, like, you need to make an impression. Do you, like, you want them to remember you, don't do everything like that, that everyone, everybody else does. But at the same time, like, is, is there a line that you don't want to cross? Yes. And this, I'm not advocating people start disregarding mm. scripts. That, that's not what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. You know, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I started to play with things in a way that felt fun to mm. me, you know, like, you know, trying to like, well, Brandon Potter, this obscure actor I saw on this great podcast said yeah, that I should yeah, like, yeah. like, that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. But what I am saying is that when people are crafting their auditions, that's the time to exercise your creativity, mm-hmm. whatever that means to you. Yeah. You know, it's important that you stay engaged and you have fun. Otherwise, it's such a demoralizing business anyway. If you're not having fun in a demoralizing business, yeah. it's brutal, right? So you've got to have fun in this demoralizing business or you can't move forward. Yeah, it's true. Uh, because, you know, people say, oh, it must be hard to only get one gig after 10 auditions. I was like, one out of 10. That would be amazing. Yeah, no, it's one out of 100. It's one out of 1,000. All I do is hear no every day, you know, and that's got to be amusing to you. So that's how I made it interesting for me to do this stuff. And it ended up doing something. I think not because I made some like, great comedic choice but i think the people watching could say like all right he's doing something i don't know he, you know he's invested he's he's kind of funny he's you know he's having fun he's he making enjoys choices himself yeah, the yeah. Job i mean that's yeah there was one time so i did this one show it, it, and, and this happened so i guess i've already told you this happened in the commercials but it happened in a narrative too i, I the, my first I, get, I think it was my first TV gig, mm. which was a show called Special on Netflix, which was a, a really fun show. And the creator was was really fun and really funny. And he took an interest in the casting of the show. So he had this sh- he he had the show. I was supposed to play like a physical therapist, mm. right? And I was working with uh, the the writer and creator of the show, a guy named Ryan. And in the audition, I did not stick to the script at all. I just said what I wanted to say, and uh, I got the part. And so I was meeting the star of the show on the day. And uh, he said, that was a terrific audition. You really made us laugh. So thanks for that. You know, and I was like, great. So we can just sort of play and like, I'll just say whatever and you can say whatever. And we'll just let the cameras kind of go. And he's absolutely not. Say the words as written, you know. So I got the part by saying something else. 
But on the day, I was not to say anything else. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think I revealed something about my comedic sensibilities in that audition, and he sort of trusted that I would make. The, so the that's interesting work. because they, they kind of basically they cast you for who you are because you showed yourself proper yourself like at sure. the audition. But they said like, but in the end, yourself, but saying this. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It wouldn't work always, like because like I've heard some some uh, some writers are being very very protective of their job because like well you're an actor I'm a writer yeah I don't act you don't write <laughs> yeah uh, well in uh, on on stage that would never work you know like you, I would I would be laughed out of a room if I thought I could write a better scene than Arthur yeah. Miller yeah. you know that I would be. Fired. I would not get the job if I auditioned for all my sons with my own dialogue. Yeah. Right? That wouldn't that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, I think in 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 the commercial and some of the TV world, right? Writers are a little bit more lax. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, I've been on film sets where you, you say like, uh, "Can I do something else here?" Can I? And the director goes like, uh, "Yeah, yeah, we'll get one the regular way, and, and then get one doing whatever you want to do." Right? That never happens if you're doing True West, right? Like that on stage, that would never happen. No, of course. I mean, because yeah. like you, you probably if it's Shakespeare, he knew better. Than yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting because like as you know. <laughs> 99% of what we do is a rejection, <laughs> just yeah. constant rejection. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a good advice just like to kind of try to have fun because I've heard, I don't remember who said it, but a lot of actors say it, like when you go to the audition, you already get a job. This audition is a job, yeah. have fun. Yeah. Just use it like as, as a chance to perform and, and, you know, work in your craft. There's kind of a mindset where, you know, like if you're doing a comedy, And the funny part is when you ask for the salt, right? In a scene, right? Oh, can you pass the salt, right? Yeah. And the audience laughs. <laughs> um, if you start asking for the joke instead of asking for the salt, they will not laugh, right? You, you have to sort of, you have to just ask for the salt. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you, As soon as you start trying to please someone else, mm -hmm. you're, you've kind of already lost the battle. Mm -hmm. You have to amuse like yourself in an authentic and honest way. You like genuinely amuse and engage with yourself and you know your mm -hmm. scene partner and let them figure out what the joke is. Mm -hmm. And I think those auditions were s sort of a form of that, right? Sort of showing myself fully engaged with the material in a way that I thought was yeah. it was fun, not catering to what I thought someone else mm -hmm. uh, might think of as fun. And, and I think that's probably what read. Um, I can't imagine that I won't do that in the future. I can't imagine that, you know, if I do, Uh, an audition that doesn't have anything to do with the scene or the lines, a lot of people will still push me away because of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, 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 of course I've lost jobs from it, obviously, Yeah. you know, but I've also lost jobs for like everything. Yeah. I've lost jobs because he does a weird thing with his mouth. Or, yeah, or uh, he's too tall. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. His eyebrows are a little too pointy, you know, <laughs> like whatever, dude, you lose jobs yeah. for all kinds yeah. of reasons. It might as well be for fun. Uh, is it mostly kind of in room auditions or self tapes now? Because here in the UK, uh, I don't remember when was the last time I was in a room. I did self tapes for last probably even before the pandemic, I think it was mostly self tapes. Uh, it's mostly self tapes. Um, The last time I was in a room was January, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was only after I had done a self tape. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you ever get into a room now, it's because you, <laughs> they, uh, they like to self tape. Yeah. Um, even like callbacks and stuff are now through these like, like apps or like a zoom meeting or, oh, or something like that. Yeah. 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 Which is really goofy. I know a lot of people that, um, feel like they're losing out on jobs because they're not in a room and you see, you know, the old advice, like, Oh, you audition for the room, not the, not the part, you know, win the room, not the part. Uh, meaning that they get a chance to connect with the people in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. 
What, what, what would you prefer? Do you do you prefer self tips or? In the I room? like meeting people in the room. Yeah. I think that I would not have gotten the jobs that I was telling you about mm -hmm. if I was auditioning in the room because they never would have let me set up intro music and bring a wig into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in a strange way, although I prefer to be in a room full of people and be able to connect and talk with them, I know that I've only gotten the gigs that I've gotten in the last few years because I was doing whatever it is that I was yeah. doing with those auditions, mm -hmm. you know? So. I like one, but the other one has been more effective for me. I, the, this, when you in the room, do you get nervous as well? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I don't know. You know, sometimes like my heart rate doesn't change when I go on stage. And mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't change when I go into an audition mm -hmm. room, you know. But it's always nice when it does. Because yeah. I feel like that's kind of why I liked it to begin with, you know. It's like a little bit of adrenaline. I mean, obviously... Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bringing joy to people is fun and, you know, getting to exercise mm -hmm. your creative brain is fun, but a lot of it's the thrill, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you deal with nerves? Oh, um, a lot of it's breath. I think mm -hmm. for me, I know for sure. Uh, one of my problems sometimes that I'm working on, especially like when I'm on stage, uh, just in general, I think I can be too quiet and at some point I, I realized that a lot of it was because of nerves a little bit especially in the beginning of the show like yeah when you do when you're doing theater like in like in the very scene that you do like you kind of you're a little bit nervous so you, you your breathing is, is very constrained yeah. and your voice goes down completely yeah. especially like in theater people on the far you know far row should be able to hear you yeah that's right <laughs> so that's one of the things that uh, i know that yeah as soon as i kind of do nerves and you know breathe a little bit then it goes away and when i concentrate on my partner yeah concentrate on the partner i think is like a a really big part of it mm -hmm. um and and yeah man that 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 breath mm -hmm. uh, it is important you know like um on screen they're like viewers right um in a theater it's the audience mm -hmm. though right audio it's yeah. they're listening it's it's that that's why there's more speaking in a play because that's how the action is transmitted in a play mm -hmm. is speaking right yeah. whereas on screen it's all visual mm -hmm. right you can have a scene where someone's just walking away from an exploding plane and that mm -hmm. has great impact in a movie mm -hmm. and would mean nothing on stage like and just in general like i think in in, in screen like you can have you know very tight close up and you can see absolutely everything. Yeah, you can that's, see that's, everything. That's where, where, like, when you don't want to be too big, you know, when sure. you want just to be. <laughs> and because of that, I think working with your breath and your voice on stage is is so incredibly important, not just because the people in the back can hear you, right? Mm -hmm. But because, you know, when you were talking about that sort of constrained breath, you know, if you can take that time on stage or before you get on stage to open up your breathers, to breathe all the way down into your mm -hmm. hips or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it helps you speak, right? So that everyone can hear you, but it also helps you reveal yourself, mm -hmm. right? Because instead of being in a defensive position where you're ready to like take a punch or something, I don't know, mm -hmm. you're able to be soft and open and available, mm -hmm. you know, which is what you need for your partner. Yeah. And it's what you need for the audience, honestly, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what, what do you enjoy more? Theater or screen? Well, I, I'm sort of old and I've been doing this for a while. I'm probably doing this for 20 years at this point. Mm -hmm. And I, it goes in and out what I like to do. Um, it depends on the project, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly the project and sort of where I am, yeah. you know, like, after doing 10 shows a week of the same play that I've done for years, right? Something like Christmas Carol. It was really exciting to do commercial work mm -hmm. where we were doing improv takes. Still had, you know, two hours of the day left. Mm -hmm. And the whole crew goes, all right, what else you got? That was enormously satisfying. Even though it was like only a commercial and commercials aren't supposed to be creatively satisfying. Mm -hmm. But it was satisfying. I did. I got to do something new and fresh and in the moment i got to exercise sort of my own like improv isn't exactly writing but sort of so that was very satisfying and then sometimes i'll be up there you know hawking a cheeseburger or whatever and mm -hmm. and, and think if only i could do something with you know quote unquote substance you know so it just sort of depends i there's nothing like an audience being there a nice full house mm -hmm. for a great play there's nothing like that yeah. But it's also nice to collect a good paycheck for something that happens spontaneously and in the moment. What satisfaction do you get from doing like 
film series. That has been a strange journey for me, man, because, you know, doing plays, you get that instant feedback from the yeah. audience. Doing a television series, you don't, right? You sort of only hear about how it's going later, like later year. online yes. uh, from reviews. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing this one show called The Chosen and we have to do press stuff, right? So we'll do junkets, which means that people like come and ask you questions about the show. And a lot of times they're the same questions, like what's in store for season five or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, like, you know, that kind of stuff. And a lot of actors didn't, they were sort of like, ugh, we gotta go do press, you know what I mean? And it's an obligation, it's part of your contract. You have to go and do this stuff mm -hmm. as part of your job. And I was sort of like, I had never done any of that yeah. sort of stuff. I mean, sort of with anime, and especially recently now that anime has gotten bigger, but I had always sort of sloughed it off as part of like, as like vanity or something like this isn't the art, you yeah. know? Uh, but as I was doing these press junkets, I sort of realized that that was the only way that I was connecting with the audience mm -hmm. was through these sort of press things. And I, I started to actually kind of like them. Mm -hmm. um, and I started liking it for anime too. I started enjoying talking with people about what it is that I was doing on any given project, because that's the only way I could get a feel for what people were yeah. responding to, mm -hmm. you know, like ultimately I want to bring joy to people, you know, and as I was sort of sequestering myself on set and not engaging fully with the press stuff, I realized that like, I had no idea if I was giving people joy or not. All I did was like be there in the moment making yeah. the art, which is fine and dandy mm -hmm. for some sort of heady artistic pursuit. But ultimately I'm there mm -hmm. to bring something to people. And the only way that I could get confirmation or, or, or criticism of that was to talk to people about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's different doing films and series because you don't get instant gratification. You sort of have to use all these other sort of pathways to connect with the audience. And I very much enjoyed that aspect of it, even though yeah. I don't think I'm supposed to. No, I, well, for now you do. Maybe like after 20 more years, you will say like, <laughs> oh, to just, just press record. Let's do like the same oh, questions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Pre recorded questions, the answers here. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, how, I, I, I haven't watched The Chosen, um, but I watched quite a few scenes with you on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Oh, right you're on. very good. Oh, I really thanks, love your man. character. Can you tell me how how did you like how did you work in this character? Like, is there anything specific that you thought of when you worked on basically creating him? Yeah. So it it w w was an important audition for me for a lot of reasons. One of them is because I'm pretty sure that part was more or less cast already out of LA. And I was in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. I did not live in LA. I have a place in LA now that I, mm -hmm. that I spend time at. But mm -hmm. at the time uh, when I got this role, I was still in Texas mm -hmm. and it's a series regular role. So they were looking to, to people who had, uh, what's the word experience, right? At, at, out of LA. Mm -hmm. And a local casting artist had told the director, Dallas Jenkins, like, oh, you got to come and see this guy for this other role. You got to come and see this guy for this other role. And he obliged, which is crazy, like nuts that he gave me the time of day, but he did. I would later learn that he's an incredible uh, creative collaborator. Mm. And I think people who are that open and that expressive, they do things like see people they shouldn't see. They just mm. check it out, right? Well, you know, what's the harm? So. I read the script and I liked the script and I liked the character a lot, but I showed up on the day and he was there, which is crazy that the director of the show was going to be there, but okay. That showed me, he's like, I don't really want to do what we've written. I, I don't want to do like a lazy, disinterested Roman. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you have any other ideas? And Andre, because I sort of gotten so used to disregarding scripts yeah. and doing my own thing. I was like, yeah, I already know. Yeah. Let's, let's try this. Let's, yeah. let's make him like a really intense bureaucrat. Let's make him like a rule follower. Mm -hmm. Let's make him like he's ambitious and wants to do something with his career. Mm -hmm. He really thinks he's bringing law and order to the savages out here in the wilds. Right. Yeah. And he was like, all right, try that. And the thing is like, I asked him if we could do some different lines, he's like, no, do the same lines, but just do them like this other person. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah. 
I sort of primed my skills of improvising and thinking outside of the box of the script. And it came in very handy for mm. right now. What is the most important gig yeah. to me? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that prepped me for that. So on the day when I was there with Dallas, I was used to doing something that was different. I was used to taking the lines and taking them in a different direction. I was used to saying, okay, all the homework that you were doing, like throw it away. Yeah. Let's do something else. Yeah. I had kind of primed myself mm -hmm. for that. So we got to play and we really did play. We played for like 20 minutes, just doing 30 minutes, doing this new thing that we were both making in the moment. And that's just, that's an addition. Yeah, that was the audition. 20, 30, like it's almost like a workshop, basically. Yeah, yeah it was. Nice. It was crazy. Like, it's great. I, after, after that, and he also, he, he's a funny guy. Like, um, he doesn't say action. He says, here we play, which like, because I was, I was in that moment, I was yeah. playing because we yeah. were making something new. Yeah. I, at that moment, I thought like, it kind of doesn't matter if I get the part or not. Like I had a really good time yeah, today, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, working that's with someone. Like the taking of the pressure is like, f at least for me, I don't know how, how, how about for you, but I think taking off the pressure is half job done because as soon as you're starting just playing and enjoying, even if it's something that not exactly the director wants, it will be interesting. It will be something that will engage people with like, oh, this is, I want to see it. Maybe that's not perfect for this scene, but I like what he does or she, or for them, whatever. It's just that that uh, ability for the director and for this set, like for such an environment, because it's casting, like still it's, it's audition. Like you kind of, you still have, even if you try not to have, like not to feel pressure, there, real, there is a little bit. Like to take off this pressure, it's, uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I, it, it was, and um, I, I, I just, I remember that day really well. And I remember thinking like, this was a ball, mm -hmm. man. Yeah, like I, 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 there's no way I've got this gig. They're going to use someone from LA that, that mm. is more famous. And like, I got used to that in Texas. Mm. So my, you know, agents or directors are like, yeah, bring in Brandon, bring in Brandon. Mm. And like, yeah, well, I went to someone famous. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to someone famous, you know? So I got that all the time. So that was not, um, not that I'm in competition with famous people, just people that are more famous than me, right? I'm small potatoes and these are medium potatoes that are beating me out, right? I'm not, I'm so not if right. you're small potatoes, I'm really, really no, tiny potatoes. No, no, we're the same potatoes. <laughs> nah. Um, yeah, but I, I, I really, I really just had a ball, and it was a shock when I got the parts. Like, Wait, they were really going to use me? Nice. All right, so uh, did and, I, and I've had a great time doing mm -hmm. it. But the, some of the stuff that like stayed with it. So in that, in those moments of play, is that we're not going to do a lazy guy, right? And I was like, okay, so we're going to do someone who's like really, really forward leaning. You know what I mean? Real, real detail oriented. Yeah. So that. So when I was doing that, that affected how I was performing it, right? Like that character over enunciates mm -hmm. and tries to be proper all of the time yeah, yeah, and, you know, all of that yeah. stuff. Like, so I made it in everything that he does, right? Is like this sort of like, mm -hmm. he's always, it's really manicured, mm -hmm. right? He's trying to like present something, you know, and that stayed, right? That stayed for the, I mean, that stayed for the show, right? That's mm -hmm. who Quintus is. And that, that wasn't like. That wasn't a, a thing that I did on my own. That was something that happened in the room because he said, let's try something else. Yeah, nice. You know, what I noticed with Quintus is his laugh. Yeah. The yeah. laugh is specific. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's per, like on purpose because like he laughed, like there are a few things about he laughs like with like surprise, like, oh my God, I, you, you can't be this naive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think people like it too. And um, I, there's a, you know, it was something like that. Because it's sort of a different laugh, mm -hmm. right? Like it's a very Quintus specific laugh. Mm -hmm. When you present, when you present something like that, you're like, okay, I don't know how to say this. I wanted that to be something that would be like memorable for the audience to latch on to this guy. Mm -hmm. Trying to be memorable is a dangerous game, right? That could have been so fake that no one bought it, mm -hmm. right? It could have been awful. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that when you're like, all right, I'm going to give him a trademark laugh. That is like dangerous territory. Yeah. But I, I trusted everyone around me. I was like, if this is crappy, they'll tell me. And they would, right? Dallas is very good at that. And be like, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. well, it's good you tried. Yeah, exactly, exactly. He would have been kind about it, but I did it, and some I got some giggles from the from the crew who were working it, and uh, and I was like, okay. And I kind of looked at Dallas, and he was like, 
all right, <laughs> let's do it, you know? They stuck it in there, and it's lived, you know? Um, it, anytime I can kind of plug that laugh in, you know, I do. Yes, Dominus, my dog guards it while I'm away. <laughs> oh, Matthew, you are a priceless treasure. Of course you have a dog. Nice, I love it, I love it. Uh, look, how do you prepare for, for, for the role, for the scene? What's your process? Do you have like your own process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's old. It's usually just old text analysis stuff. I mean, sometimes, I mean, some scenes you can just sort of like memorize the lines. I mean, you don't need to like break down the, the rhetorical devices used in a cheeseburger commercial, right? Like that. Sometimes you do, but, but, but not all the time. So I almost always start with just what's happening and where the turns are right uh like what events are in the scene especially you have to work fast right and a lot of times in commercial stuff and on screen you do have to kind of work fast mm -hmm. right like if you're doing a play you might do like a very intensive period of research right like how do you pronounce this what does this word mean what is the actual like roots of this word who is this person you know through the punctuation or the language or what are the what are the chief events in a scene so that i can work to a turn right oh my gosh where were you during lunch right mm -hmm. and 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 then exist truthfully in that beat right and then where's the next turn mm -hmm. you know and exist truthfully in that beat and you know that kind of beat to beat work helps like scenes are short enough on screen that like there's one or two, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can work towards those sorts of goals, like you, you're already you're already working with something. You're already you've already got raw material for everyone to play with, you, the director, your mm -hmm. scene partner, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um for commercial stuff, it can sometimes help, you know, like even if it isn't like B2B, there's usually only one turn in a commercial, right? Like how do I use this thing? I don't like this one thing. Oh, here's the perfect product, right? That's where the turn is. Um <laughs> It, it, but you do have to incorporate that turn clearly, yeah. right? So that people get that they should buy this thing to solve this problem, you know? Um, so I almost always start with text. And then from there, uh, you know, I wander around and play with those beats and mm -hmm. turns until something amusing happens, mm -hmm. I guess. So if I can, I imagine the people that I'm working with, like we have a scene together. Yeah. So I don't have to imagine the person that I'm working with. I can picture you, yeah. right? And I have had the pleasure of working with you before. So that is fun to me to imagine us playing out this scene mm -hmm. with Russians and spy handlers and stuff like that. And eventually, in, when I'm walking around, I'll do it today before the shoot. You know, I'll walk around and, and sort of imagine, you know, what is going to go like it. Sort of running lines, yeah. sort of, but mostly about like what these events are. And sometimes when I'm going through, like, and sort of, you know, mulling these uh, events over, I, I come across, I guess, inspiration or something. Or like, ooh, I could do it that way. Ooh, this would be fun. What if I don't think of him this way? What if I think of him this way? What if, oh, what if Andre does it and it actually is kind of frightening to me? What do I? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I guess I have to be ready in case he's like intimidating or what, because he's funny too. What if he's, what if he's, I gotta be ready, you know? So it kind of prepares me to like be open to whatever the other actor brings to, yeah. you know, yeah. when I, when I think about like, I don't know how many different ways this thing could go. Um, I, I think that's like the short version. Yeah. Like break it down to events and then deploy my imagination. There's other stuff too. I mean, like, I think I was trained in that in the, in the old classical sense, which would be like given circumstances, objective and action, mm -hmm. right? To like Stanislavski, yeah. you know, and then obviously people throw in, you know, communication with your partner, mm -hmm. like the sort of Meisnery stuff. Mm -hmm. And probably the sense of play would be something like kind of gamifying scenes, which might be like Spolin or something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's all. all that that stuff is deep enough in the creative process from from acting school. Some usually I don't have to think too much about it. But if I ever get stumped, mm -hmm. then I one hundred percent go back to that stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, th I think I think that that's the same for me as well. Because like there, are, like sometimes there are scenes that like you read, like yeah, I, I kind of understand everything. 
straight away. But that's also the danger, I think, because yes. you become like it's like it's too if it's too obvious, then everyone everyone can do this. Then why are you doing this? Right. That's the thing. So like you kind of and that that's the trap that I kind of get into. I think a lot, and I'm trying to get out of this trap because mostly uh, at my level, I don't get a lot of you know juicy parts when you can like experiment. I think like it's just most like it's evil Russian KG, KGB, like, and you kind of you kind of I do do sometimes play into the stereotype, and I know it's my mistake, and I'm trying to get out of it. But in general, yeah, I think I think that's kind of like when you kind of get I I really like kind of mammoth technique. Yeah. So, and it's kind of for me, it's, it's, it makes the most sense, I think, out of everything that I tried because it's just like you're concentrating on your partner. You know, your kind of objective. You know, your intentions. You, you, you use your tactics. Uh, but again, yeah, sometimes there are, there are scenes that I kind of like, I mostly in class because this is the hardest scenes I did, the most hardest, like, Thing, uh, scenes I did were in class and I'm trying like I'm, I'm uh, this year I kind of like I'm, I'm skipping a lot because I'm just you know doing this uh, but for last like for like six years I was doing weekly classes yeah. almost all the time and dude I still the, go to classes man anytime in one place for a while yeah. Yeah, yeah and then you kind of like the best like one of the best scenes you get because you work on classics you work on some amazing scenes from films from from place and, and sometimes there are scenes I'm like I'm not smart enough to understand the scene. <laughs> you read this like in this like the, the dark variations scene, and I'm like, what are they talking about? I don't understand. <laughs> and then you spend so much time analyzing it. They're like, oh, that's what you mean. Nice. And then like, no, wait, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. All right, all right. And uh, I'm guessing it's. How, how easy it is for you like now to learn the lines? How much time do you need? It depends. Yeah, yeah it depends. When, when I was young, I wasn't a, do you know what a quick study is? Like a quick study is someone who can like look at a page and then, okay, let's go, right? <laughs> that, I, think, so this, I think they used to be called like photographic memory or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I am not a quick study, but for a while in my youth, I was pretty close yeah. actually. Um, it was kind of a party trick I could do, and it, it came in handy for a few gigs. Yeah. But um, I think I developed that when I was younger and much more self-involved than I am now. Mm -hmm. I did a whole lot of one-person shows. Mm -hmm. So it would just be me on stage for an hour and a half or an hour. Well, um, uh, Sometimes they were good, Andre. Sometimes they were not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, gosh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I've done a lot of bad solo theater, yeah. um, but, but I've done some good stuff too. Yeah. Um, uh, but all of that sort of uh, worked out that memory muscle, mm -hmm. you know, and I was able to to get um, kind of a system for myself to be able to to get the lines in my skull fast, mm -hmm. you know, and that it involves the same stuff that I, I didn't learn a memory technique, but I figured out how to memorize lines for me. And as I read about memory techniques, I realized that I was doing something mm -hmm. that they do, which is like essentially a memory palace. Mm -hmm. If you know what that is. Is it like a room where you kind of imagine where everything is? Oh. Yeah. And like people who do card tricks where they memorize the deck, you know, mm -hmm. they, they make essentially a physical space yeah. that they can move through that has, which that's just using your imagination mm -hmm. to fill in meaning and uh, and imagery for for these words which mm -hmm. is, is what i do mm -hmm. and, and that seems to help you know what i mean like interesting yeah uh, it, it, it can get things moving fast the, the problem with that sort of is is that if you start memorizing lines before you have a clear goal in terms of like being open or or working with the scene you memorize the lines wrong you already kind of like yeah, I imagine some yeah. some you know tactics and intentions and like just actions that are not correct. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they're, they're not flexible. So mm -hmm. I have to I have to be careful of that. I've gotten mm -hmm. better with that as I've gotten older. But I, I also have like I feel like now I have a little bit more of a a little more luxury. Like when I was doing that stuff, it wasn't because I was if it wasn't because of a failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was taking that shortcut because you know when I was young I would do all of these plays, you know what I mean? Like I was doing, yeah, I would do like several plays at once, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that sort of stuff, especially like in acting school. It's yeah. not like I did this for 
a, a job. You yeah, know, it wasn't like in two Broadway productions at the same time or anything like that. But you know, I, but I was doing several different plays at once, and it, it was just important that I get the lines into my head. Mm-hmm. You know, if I didn't want to embarrass myself, so I kind of came up with that with that shortcut. As I've gotten older, and I don't have to do that anymore, I. I try and spend a little bit more time figuring out what it is I want to do with the script before I start memorizing anything, mm-hmm. you know, to no. keep them as blank as possible. Do you still do voiceovers for anime or not? Uh, not, I don't do a whole lot of voiceovers for anime right now because I'm traveling too much, yeah. but I still do voiceover for video games. I've yeah. got a session next week for a, a video game. Oh, nice. Nice. Which one? Or I cannot it's... tell you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, can, can you explain to me like the process of working on anime as a like voiceover artist? Because I'm 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 assuming it's like anime is, is very big, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to be big. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's the process? Well, it sort of depends. Like some some are really big, like Dragon Ball, <laughs> right? You know, you're sort of yelling all the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, not all of them are that way. There's a whole lot of like romance and drama shows mm. where you're, it, it's actually pretty small, but you mm. still have to communicate the meaning through, you know, a smaller vocal performance. Um, so it, I'm not sure so much it has to do with size uh, of a performance as it has to do with um, a lot of technical aspects. Mm. Like being able to read the lines in such a way that it matches the flaps, right? The flaps we were talking yeah. about. So, you know, you, you you watch a scene, right? And you're looking for how your character is talking. And then the, there'll be three beeps. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the fourth beep is ostensibly when you're supposed to talk, right? You, you've done this mm-hmm. stuff before mm-hmm. or anything like that. Okay. So... What do I mean by like technical aspects would be like on that fourth beat, you're supposed to start talking and it's supposed to match their flaps, right? But it's also supposed to match what their face is doing and the physical mm-hmm. uh, reality of the scene, right? So if they're pushing a boulder, the vocal performance needs to reflect that they're pushing a boulder, yeah. right? If they're getting into a hot bath, the vocal performance needs to reflect that they're getting into a hot bath, mm-hmm. right? It's not just... I'm nervous because my crush is around or I'm angry because my nemesis is around. Yeah. There's other sort of physical reality stuff that you have to match. So it's not exactly like acting, like you were talking about with Mammoth's technique, where you filter um, given circumstance, objective and action through uh, your partner's actions, right? It's not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about what is already there that is set in stone and you have to present that in a way that mm-hmm. is in harmony with what's going on What's, mm-hmm. what, with what's already going on on screen. In terms of like size of the performances, I, I think that, you know, you can go whatever way you want. You know, um, some shows are like really quiet and dead. Mm-hmm. And if only I had my lover here. Right. Something like that. And some are like the sort of <laughs> wacky. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> um, that, that just goes like, you know, minute by minute. I, I think like largely what I'm doing for this video game next week is a bunch of like background characters that get killed. Right. Uh, so it's a lot of like bad guy stuff. Like, I'll get you. Mm-hmm. Right. And then of course, because it's a video game and people fight and die, I'm screaming all day. Right. So I get to die by getting dunked in acid. I get to die by getting burned to death. I get to die by being frozen to death. I get to die by being hypnotized to death. Right. I get to die by getting cut in half with a laser. So it's a whole lot of screaming. So there's the technical aspects of matching what's going on on screen. And there's a whole other set of technical aspects, which is like, how do you deal with screaming for that long? You do need to like, do, do, do like some kind of vocal warm ups and everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've made, I've been, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I've made the mistake of not warming up, you know, and sometimes I think like the scenes that you're too confident and you're like, yeah, I got this. Right. Yeah. No, it was not all right. My, you know, my voice will get shredded. Yeah. Right. But if I can do a, a brief warm up, yeah. you know, and get my chords a little bit limber before I go in, it makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of it is, When you're in acting school, man, they'll tell you that like if you if you have a good technique, you can make any sound and you can do it for forever. That's so dumb, right? Like there's only so much you can use your voice, and there's only so much you can do with it. Yeah. And part of a good vocal technique is knowing when the damage is too much. 
Knowing right. your limits, basically. Yes. Yeah. So having the confidence and trusting that your employers are reasonable enough to say, mm -hmm. I've been screaming for two hours now. I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember the days when people would try and push you more. Mm -hmm. But now that this industry is so established and enough actors have said like you can't do this mm -hmm. for that long they'll just say okay cool we'll cut there and we'll bring you back in for another day mm -hmm. it's already built into the budget because we know that this sort of thing happens right it didn't used to be that way mm -hmm. but now it is which is really really nice mm -hmm. right i almost never get pushed to any sort of like injury and if i yeah. do now i'm old enough that if someone tries to i'm like no mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not doing that like a this paycheck isn't worth yeah. hurting myself for. Because like, if you will hurt yourself, you might miss some more jobs in the future as well. Like, yeah, and there's also like your body and your sort of personal mm. dignity, right? Mm. Like we're clowns, but that doesn't mean that we don't have We want to be clowns on our own, you know. Yeah, on our own terms, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's also like, I mean, there's there's just anatomy that's different, right? Some people's voices can take it more and some people's can't. That's just the way that it is. Some mm -hmm. people's voices last until they're old and some people's don't. Like, luck of the draw, like anything else with your anatomy. You, you know what I mean? Like, that is what it is. That There's not technique that can help that, right? But um, it, 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 if you do explore a, a vocal technique, go all the way so that your limits are your physiology, not your technique, mm. you, you know, uh, yeah. and, and like develop those warm ups so that it's your, it's the physical limits that are holding you back, not whether or not you warmed up. Because yeah. if not warming up stops you from doing a good job, like, then well, you're not doing a good yeah, job. Exactly. Already. <laughs> yeah. Then you're not doing your job as an actor, you know? And a lot of that is like, you know, for me is like a lot of, I have to explore a whole bunch of range. I have to warm up. Another thing that helps cooling down, mm -hmm. you know, after a, a really hard session, doing some vocal exercises that sort of gently ease you out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, to be fair, I never heard about that. Uh, I never had either. So there was a time when I was doing like audiobooks in the morning, anime in the afternoons, and then this big, long, like three hour history play at night where I was on stage the whole time. And, uh, I started to lose my voice and we were still doing this play. I was still doing these audiobooks, still doing this anime. And, uh, and I went to the, I went to the voice doctor and uh, he said, your throat is bleeding. Um, and it, that's the bad news. The good news is it's bleeding everywhere, which means you're not misusing your voice. Um, okay. Uh, so, so they gave me some steroids to like, uh, to make it better. Steroids, by the way, make you feel insane. Like it was an awful experience feeling wise, but it fixed my voice immediately. <laughs> what, it was, insane? Yeah. What, what way insane? Uh, my skin felt like I was on fire. I was hungry all the time. I couldn't sleep. It oh, was wow. crazy. I felt like I was out of my mind, but my voice sounded so good. Yeah. Um, Screaming. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's like physical limits there, right? But I was doing that sort of stuff and I was talking to a vocal coach about it and, uh, and, uh, and she was like, this is overuse. Like, there's no way around this. That, that, that Nothing is going is going to help. Mm. Um, but as I went to the next project, I sort of like pared down what all I was doing. And I started to run into the same problem again. And she was like, uh, you, have you tried cooling down after shows? Mm. And I started doing that and it helped enormously. So are you doing kind of the same stuff that you, you do while you're warming up or is it a different set of uh, exercises? Different set of exercises, oh. slightly different. Mm. So, you know, um, I don't want to move as much air over my vocal cords and I'm cooling down. Mm. So it isn't the same sort of like, mm -hmm. I'm not working on like projecting, I'm not working on like diaphragmatic support. For cooling down, it's a lot of like, elevators you know yeah, 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 yeah. and seeing like and hydrating and stuff like that mm. uh, obviously mm. um interesting yeah, yeah it was helpful i didn't i don't I, i don't exactly understand why it works yeah but it does uh you worked with tessa thompson mm -hmm. how how was it working with her it's great uh so that movie was called little woods and i, I had a couple of scenes with her and It was kind of bonkers, man, because at, at the time I was doing a play in Houston, it was so weird because like Houston, this, this theater, they were being really intense about like me not leaving to do 
uh, this movie. Right. They cared about what they were doing. Right. Uh, but they, it came across as sort of like, dude, there's no reason I couldn't go on a day off and do this thing and then come back. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's, there's no reason, but they were acting like, how, how dare you take other work while, you know, I was like, come on, man, you know, so they're being sort of highfalutin and hoity toity yeah. about it. And I go to this, this set with, uh, uh, on Little Woods with Tessa Thompson and the director, Nia DaCosta, who's gone on to do some like great stuff. Mm -hmm. and so they were both like experienced and really talented people. That was the first movie I'd ever done. Mm -hmm. And coming from this theater that was being like so into, you know, I sort of thought that when I got on set that it would be, th that they would, that it would be fancy, right? That, mm -hmm. that I would be, this theater wasn't exactly, mm -hmm. they weren't being mean or bad or anything, but they were like, they're really giving me a hard time. Mm -hmm. And I sort of thought like, well, if this theater is giving me a hard time, gosh, I bet this like big movie is oh, going to be so even harder absolutely. to work with. Like, I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm working with someone who's famous. Like I knew Tessa Thompson mm -hmm. at the time, you know, mm -hmm. I, I knew of her. I mm -hmm. thought she was great. I was already yeah. a fan, you know? And I was like, I, ugh, this is just going to be a hard week at work. But then I went there mm -hmm. and like, she was so nice. And the director was so nice. I came in and I had this like really intense take, mm -hmm. right. Or I was being like, I was, I was supposed to be like this kind of well-meaning man who needed pain pills, mm -hmm. but I was playing him like a junkie who was going to yeah. kill her if I didn't get it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, because I wasn't supposed to have that part. I was supposed to have a smaller part, but I got bumped mm -hmm. up the ranks. So right. I, I wasn't supposed to be there. So I came in, I did the first take and it was just so mm -hmm. grim, you know? And Tessa was like, Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> that's how you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> and the director came up and was like, so we're going to do this instead of that. And like, great job, but you need to yeah. do this and that yeah. and sort of that. They were both like really, really kind. Mm -hmm. And, um, I sort of watched her work on set and the way that she was able to assert herself and contribute to mm -hmm. the storytelling. Like she didn't just come on and say her lines and leave, you know, she would be there and she'd be like, Oh, Oh, this prop was actually in a different spot. Mm -hmm. Can someone help me keep an eye on this prop? Y you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, right. She's like engaging with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw her work, um, on, I only worked with her for like two days or something mm -hmm. like that. But on both of those days, she was really a part of the movie making. And I thought if ever I was going to idolize someone or like try to imitate them, like yeah. that kind of participation in movie making and like, she was so big and famous and like, she remembered me when I went to the, the rap party, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I felt like I was a part of it because she was including everyone in it. Yeah. And the same thing with the director. Like the director didn't make me feel like I was some idiot who'd never been on a movie set before, which I was mm -hmm. some idiot who had never been on a movie set before. Instead, she talked to me in like a sort of calm way mm -hmm. to get what she needed. And we did. Nice. You know? yeah, yeah. That's the example that you want to give, like, especially yeah. if you lead them. Like it was film. really yeah. sweet. I, I thought, I thought about that recently, actually. Um, I, and I, I wrote the, the director an email and I was like, you know, I don't think it would have gotten any of the jobs that I got unless you had given me a chance. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I would be as secure as I am on set unless you had been such a kind and sort of open leader, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and Tessa. Mm -hmm. And she wrote me back. She was nice. like, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm going to pass that on to the producers. That means a lot. You That's know? amazing. Yeah, it was really, it was a really lovely experience and one that I hope uh, to, to, like I said, imitate for if I'm ever in a position, mm. you know, to work with somebody who's less experienced or whatever, to sort of to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm pretty sure you are already in the position where you work with with less experienced people, so you already can do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, you said you had like you did a lot of weird and bad shows. I mean, like yeah. one hundreds. What would be like your biggest failure on on the uh, stage, and what did you learn from it? <laughs> so I've done. I mean, I've done a ton of bad theater, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I learned from it. Sometimes I didn't. The, this one is sort of hilarious because I wrote a one person show, mm -hmm. and I was actually working with someone who was experienced doing these sorts of shows. He had his own theater, and I was sort of signed on to to work with him. And the show was so personal that I didn't really promote it. I, I didn't really even, I didn't take it 
seriously, I, I, I think, I, because I was afraid to, because it was so personal to me. And I opened the show, two people were in the audience. Both of them were critics. <laughs> Neither one of them wrote about it. <laughs> It was so bad, they wouldn't even address it. Yeah. Showing up to ostensibly do their job. Uh, they didn't even, they don't, they didn't, they, they wanted no part of that mess. And it was a mess. And it was a mess because it was so personal to me that I didn't give it the time to workshop it, to show it in front of mm -hmm. people, to sort of really, really construct it. Mm -hmm. I didn't promote it because I thought like, well, whoever comes is whoever comes. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to, I don't want people who know me to know this stuff yeah, about me. Yeah. It would be okay if strangers hear these things about me, yeah. but I don't want people who know me to, to, yeah. to hear this stuff about me. So it was a failure on so many fronts. Mm -hmm. um, it was I, in some ways like clever and freeing to do that sort of stuff, but no one wants to pay for therapy. No one wants to pay to watch someone else's therapy. You know, they want to pay to see a play. And what they got was like an, a cathartic moment for me about my childhood pain. Right. Whereas if I was to actually take that pain and make it into a work of art that would provide insight and delight to an audience that would have required me sharing myself with more people. And I wasn't really ready to do that at the mm -hmm. time. And as I've gotten older and matured as an audience, uh, 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 as an actor, I, I, if I'm going to reveal myself that way, then I just, now I just do it mm -hmm. and I say it. And if I am in a project, then I just say it, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't try and like hide it away or whoever shows up, shows up. So it was an incredible failure. Mm -hmm but it also taught me a lot about how I deal with sharing myself. Mm -hmm. And I will always try and promote the things that I do mm -hmm. now. You said you weren't ready to, to talk about this stuff back then. I already know. I don't need to now. No. So I don't, I don't want to, I mm -hmm. think at that time I was, figuring out who I was an, uh, as an artist, mm -hmm. but I was also figuring out who I was as a person. And I thought that, that saying this stuff out loud, you know, would make pain go away. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the thing that is that it never really goes away. You, you just sort of make it bearable. You build, uh, I don't know, employ tools in your mind to work with it, uh, not to try and like release it out. And a lot of people always say that to you, like, oh, you, you'll just let it go, right? Like, well, I don't know how to let some stuff go. But what I do know how to do is, even if, if, if I can't let it go, to sort of accept it and see that there are, that there's beauty in it, that there's insight in it, that there's, um, uh, superpowers that some pain can give you. Mm. You know what I mean? There's all these other ways of getting therapy, right? You go to therapy and talk about mm. it, right? You don't just say it and then it suddenly evaporates. You sort of develop long-term strategies to, to cope and move forward, not mm. disappear it somehow in a public act of artistic mm. masturbation, right? Mm. That doesn't, that's not how any of this works, mm. right? Um, so have you figured out who you are now? As a person, I think I'm getting a lot closer. Yeah, I, I think accepting that I'm. This sounds so goofy, but like f flawed. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? That that there's not going to be an ideal. <laughs> there's yeah. just not yeah. that that I, I need purpose, I need to work, I need to improve myself, right? Mm -hmm. But like holding myself to some perfect standard is not helpful, right? Uh, I mean, striving to something. Striving for helpful, something, but, yeah. But at the same time, giving yourself a chance to, you know, I know not be perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I found it, like recently that I spent way more time punishing myself for my shortcomings mm. than celebrating 
the, the, the victories mm. and, 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 you know, some victories in my life, I feel are the result of luck or privilege, mm. right? And maybe they're not worth celebrating because I scratched a lottery ticket essentially. Yeah. Right. But some, I, I know that I worked for, mm. right. But I wouldn't even celebrate those. I, I was Why? still, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think, I think I thought that if I celebrated those, I would give up my quest for a, a more ideal version of myself or that if I assumed I was doing well or that I'm doing okay, that I would drop my guard. Mm. That if I didn't hurt me, then other people would. Mm. You know, I thought that I was like claiming some sort of power. And, and to some extent that that stuff kind of worked as a youth, right? I had this kind of like impervious nature because I already punished myself so much, no matter what anyone said could hurt me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you can't hate me more than I already hate myself. So I could like, yeah. people would say like, oh, you're so bold, uh, you know, on stage to do this sort of work. And I'm like, what did it matter? Because I already, I already hate myself. They can say nothing to me mm. that can hurt me because I'm all, you know, that is, and, and that's a grim way to live, mm. man. And I think I've gotten out of that as an older person and it is wild to like you know do something maybe it's a job thing or maybe it's a personal thing or maybe it's yeah. it doesn't matter what it is to do something and just be like yeah that's pretty good yeah. instead of like well anyone could have done that or i can be happen often to me i mean like saying oh that was pretty good like i'm getting used to like with acting at least getting mm -hmm. i'm getting used to seeing myself on screen but like i'm more more often i'm not happy with what i did than in comparison to what other people think about what i did yeah and well it's a good thing that the audience isn't made up of you right yeah you see what i'm saying because everyone else is like yeah great mm -hmm. one of the things that sort of helped me was like do I think that everyone else is a fucking idiot? Mm. No, mm. I don't. They're mm. capable people. They like what they like. Mm. And they like this. Mm. Who am I to say that they're wrong? Y you know? <laughs> Does it work, this thinking for you? This, this way I'm thinking now? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, because I can understand it in my brain, but emotionally, I'm still sometimes not there to kind of listen to this voice. Yeah, I don't know how to get from one place to the other. But what I do know is that, and you know what, it's not all the time. Sometimes the other way of thinking wins. Sometimes the darkness wins. It just does. But it's like it's in like professionally, but like on a personal level, how did you get to, to accepting yourself more? I started on this journey because a very wise person uh, said that the mask I'm wearing can fool everyone, but it doesn't fool him hmm. that he sees the, the, the darkness underneath. And it's a matter of time before it wins. Hmm. And to me, that sounded spot on enough that I made an earnest effort to, to work through it. And that meant going to a, a lot of therapy. That was the path that I had available hmm. to me. So I started doing a lot of therapy. What I found was, is that there's a low hum of of self-loathing that that was sort of coursing through my life mm. and trying to to every now and again say like actually pretty good man like if i look at that kid from weatherford who i thought was going to do something that was going to make him unhappy mm -hmm. and stay in a town that would have made him unhappy and i'm here talking to you instead well, it's not the one of the highlights of your life. I think <laughs> being on set today will be a highlight of your life. Talking to me probably is not. <laughs> but it is. It is. That's the thing. It's to me, it's better than being back in my hometown yeah. working on a refrigerator, right? This is yeah. better than that. So I can say to that kid, mm. you did good, man. Yeah. This is good. And I know that when I take the time to say to that kid, you did good, mm. man that that low hum of agony t 
temporarily goes away. It's not really gone. Mm -hmm. It still lives in me. But for a minute, telling that kid that he did a good job takes precedence in my mind mm -hmm. and allows me to move a little bit more unimpeded, a little bit more open and mm -hmm. honest with the people that I'm that I'm talking to. Like I'm talking to you as a person. Later on, we'll talk as actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that sort of acceptance helps me connect in both ways. Do you, mm -hmm. do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't always work, right? I still have to contend with it, right? Uh, mm. But having it sometimes is better than having it never. Mm. You see? Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you have any any kind of tools that you use on a constant level, like to remind yourself, like to okay, talk to the, to talk to the kid from from the past? Like, do you have any kind of like? Are there any mental tools that you kind of like you have in check to kind of to, to make yourself feel better? Talking to the kid in the past is yeah. a really helpful one. Mm. But how to remind yourself to, to talk to him? Or is it like when you're like, I know now I feel like shit, I need to talk to the kid. Yeah. It's that. It's also, I don't know if you ever feel this way, but I feel a sense of permanency in any emotion. Mm -hmm. It, I think it makes me a, a little bit more tuned in as an actor, but it can make being a regular person crappy mm -hmm. because when I'm down, I feel like that's the way it really is. And that's the way it's always going to be. Yeah. And, and when I start thinking that at this point, I now consciously think, even if I don't feel it, I consciously think, but you know, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know that this too, like all things will pass, mm -hmm. that you will be in a different state soon enough. Yeah. Right. And it's the same thing with the kid. I consciously think, okay, I'm feeling miserable right now, but that's better than what it, than what it could have been. That's better than I've made decisions and choices and expressed agency. I, I've done these things and that's good. Right. So there are some things like that, that are conscious tools. There are other things like, just forensically looking at what's going on. Like, what are the facts? I know I feel like a horrible piece of shit right now, but like, what are the facts? And the facts are like, I, I have a, uh, I have a partner that is a, she's amazing, right? She knows stuff about me and she still likes me, right? So I'm not looking for validation through someone else, but I can say like, she's not dumb and, and she likes me. Okay. You know, I can look at my friends and be like, they're not dumb. They know me. They've known me for a long time. And they, they like me. They said that they were proud of me for this thing. I don't feel proud of it right now, but they said it. I don't think they would say that if they didn't mean it. Right. They have no vested oh interest God, in lying. I, I, honestly, I know what he mean because I know that I argued with my friends when they said something nice to me. And I was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. There's no point of like, there's no reason, you know, saying good things to me. Yeah. yeah. That, I, I, and you have to let them like not, it's not just for you too. I mean, it's for them also. Yeah. Like they, <laughs> they, they're your friends. Their opinion should matter to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know like, it's a like, shitty thing to say, like, no, stop saying good you're things. wrong so you, about you that. Yeah, yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> your opinion, it doesn't matter Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. I feel like shit. It's yeah. It, it, it's hard and it doesn't always work, but, but I try all of those things whenever I can. And sometimes some of them work yeah. and that's better than always trying nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and it has made my sort of general life Quality. just, yeah, just better, you know, mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'm more successful than others. Sometimes I, that's something I can do a lot. Sometimes it's not. You know, um, at the moment, I feel like I'm okay at it. I think weirdly enough for the last year, I haven't been good at it. Mm. You know, the fucked up thing is, I think it's because things are going well. Isn't that crazy? Is it like you getting used to it or is it like when, when good becomes your new normal? I think it's because I didn't. Well, it's a few things actually. I think, I think I was so used to fighting all the time mm -hmm. that I didn't know how to not fight even when things were not, didn't need a fight. Mm -hmm. So I was still fighting something. It yeah. was me, not the world around me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think also I didn't trust it. It was like the world was telling me I was doing a good thing and I was like, you're wrong world, mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't trust it. I still had so much fight in me. I, um, 
was so sure that it's going to go away. And it is. Nothing lasts forever. It is going to go away. Mm. Your ice cream is going to melt. It doesn't mean you shouldn't eat it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, nothing lasts. Mm -hmm. Welcome to fucking temporal reality, you know? But while it's here, enjoy it. And I haven't, I haven't solved it yet, you know, yeah. man. I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not 100% completely better or trusting or accepting of where I am right now, you know? But I am working on it. And, and I think it's, I think it is getting better. Mm -hmm. And when it does go away, and I know that it will, I think, that I'll be able to accept that and be happy with that too. Mm -hmm. You know, if I continue to employ these same kind of tools and, and tactics, you know, nice. Look, I really hope that you will. <laughs> Thanks, I, man. Uh, I don't know you that well, but you seem to be a very good, nice person. I really enjoy talking Thanks, to you man. right now. And I think it's like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's one of the things in, in the podcast. One of the things that I really enjoy right now is that like once a week I get to, you know, be in a room with a real person, yeah. talk to them. Yeah. And when we have connection, I think it's one of the best things that, that uh, I had in life for a long time. You know what that is? That's a win, man. Good yeah. job. What motivates you to do what you do? Because uh, I have um, I have a quote from from your website. Oh, okay. I tried on a few jobs for size. Mm -hmm. I dug wells, shipped cadavers, cadavers? Cadavers, yeah. Sh shipped cadavers, and once I was sent at Macy's on 34th Street. Yeah. But acting, the only thing that stuck. I love it. I love that no matter the medium, we all open up our imaginations for others to see and muck around until the story is right. It's fun, and, and if it's done right, filled with love. So what motivates you and what is acting for you right now? Well, honestly, a lot of it is this, right? Just getting to talk to people. Um, you don't need to be an actor to talk to people, but it's... We, we live in a world when we stop talking to people. I, I spoke to my uh, acting teacher, my friend Lee Lomas, and he says one of the craziest thing that he has to do right now as acting teacher is to teach people to start talking to each other and actually mean it yeah. and asking how are you by like no not how are you and you just like how are you sure. yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, i i think that you know the world is siloed because of not at the risk of sounding like a, a, a grumpy old person a lot of social media and, and yeah uh, the way that we sort of digitally interact you don't need to be an actor to talk to people but for me the most sort of meaningful interactions that i've had have all been with people in our business or people who have come to like enjoy what we do mm -hmm. like audience members and stuff like that so there's 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 that that's how i was able to talk to people that's the sort of community i was able to join and feel at mm -hmm. home and you know the showbiz is like an isle of misfit toys right we're all sort of square pegs for a round hole and i like being around my people mm -hmm. um i think any kind of creativity anything you're interested in is a bottomless cup you can always drink from it and there's always more mm -hmm. so there have been times in my life in in my career when i got really really bored with stuff right and acting is one of the things that's easiest f to have that spark reignited mm -hmm. right if i think about it for any amount of time then i'll start getting curious and i'll want to do something about it you know what i mean i'll be like oh to be or not to be Ooh, to be or you know to be actually it'd be fun if we did it like this you know so i i it it, it sort of organically gets a rise out of me right it, and most things don't even things that i really enjoy like nice whiskey or chocolate or or roller coasters right mm -hmm. like they may not actually get <laughs> that sort they may not carbonate me they may not like set me alight they may not but acting reliably mm -hmm. does it, it may not be all the time right like i may be bored with it and thinking about becoming a dentist for six months but eventually i come back around i'm like oh this is nice i like this scene this is fun oh we should do it this way oh how about we do this you know what i think i'm gonna try and go and you know i, I start getting interested in it again and i don't i don't have that kind of relationship with any other activity you know 
Um, I should. I should get a hobby. I'm actually working on that. I think that's part of my therapy journey, actually, yeah. is getting a hobby. Are you are you working on getting a hobby or like you already found something? That you no, I'm working on it. And I don't know what it's going to be yet. Maybe it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I don't know what it would be about. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm thinking like knitting. I, I thought about like learning Portuguese. I don't know. Motorcycle riding. I like a little adrenaline. Yeah. Um, there was something else I thought about. A painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, I would never shoot to be an artist, but to do it as a hobby would be fine. Ooh, model airplanes too. I've got a lot of ideas <laughs> here, but I don't know. What well, I, maybe, maybe that's your hobby to think about hobbies. <laughs> that's right. I'm like a meta hobbyist. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, look, what would you, what would be your advice to people who want to do acting? I think that the most important thing to do would be to do it for the love of the game, mm. you know, uh, to do it as much as you can, not to wait and to do it because you love it, not because there's some sort of career. A path is what's behind you in this jungle, not what's ahead of you. There's yeah. nothing ahead of you in this. You're aware of this. You're an actor who works, right? You know that ahead of you is just untamed wilderness, right? And it's horrible and frightening if you think like, this is, I'm going to make a career out of this, right? That, 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 that. Stupid decision. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look back, you're like, oh, that was fun, that was fun, that was fun, you know, all this stuff. So I would say, first of all, do it for the, the love of the game. Um, second of all, don't wait. If you want to act, go do it. Like you said, there's classes, right? There's discord groups you can join you know if you're interested in voiceovers there's people developing video games who need free voiceovers mm. do it mm. do it uh, one of the things that you said you were talking about um you're doing the voiceover for the goblin it was like under a blanket mm. or something uh i did a lot of my early days doing voiceover with a little usb snowball mic mm -hmm. in a closet and it teaches you incredible stuff about yeah. sound. So I realized sort of the difference in mic placement for here or here, or how to avoid popping my plosives mm -hmm. by turning away, you know, like all of that stuff. Yeah. You, you learn mic technique when you have a blanket over you and not a whole lot of uh, 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 digital audio work tools yeah, yeah, uh, at yeah. your disposal. You learn a mm -hmm. shit ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people might say, oh, I'm waiting until I get a booth or I'm waiting until I get a good mic. Don't wait. Just get in there and start doing it, right? Mm -hmm. With the proliferation of media, th there's voiceovers that are needed for, for everything. None of it's... <laughs> So there's a lot of voiceover necessary. Unfortunately, that means the money is like really spread out. Mm -hmm. So that sucks. But but starting to work with people, not waiting, you mm -hmm. know, getting on those Discord servers or uh, there was like for a while, dude, I was doing these like science fiction porn novels. Mm -hmm. You know, where I would read these like stories about alien threesomes. Mm. It was for like. I guess ladies who had fantasies about alien threesomes, right? <laughs> but I read a whole series of novels, like 12 yeah. novels, man. Wow. 12 novels of this stuff, right? Uh, th there's all kinds of stuff you can do, but you, you, you got to look for it and you got to sort of change. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe what you think success is. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, in, the, in the novels thing, it's not something I bragged to my mom about, mm -hmm. right? I would be like, hey, mom, check out this alien threesome book mm -hmm. I read. But I did get really good at cold reading. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I did not want to be in the booth very long to mm -hmm. read these books. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I did them, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess it would be don't wait, go out and look for this stuff. Don't worry about like your booth or your mic, just start doing stuff and see what happens. You know, go to the community theater, be in a play, go take an acting class and see if you can get up every, see if you can get up to work every time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like be the first in line. Mm -hmm. uh, find other people who do it. You know what I mean? Like other people who are interested in this and that's where you're, that's where you're gonna find this sort of real magic. Mm -hmm. Like it's fun to perform, mm -hmm. but, but performing is only, is only 2% of, of the job. The rest is like, 
the rest is learning and training and accumulating experience in life and talking to people who do a similar thing or maybe the exact same thing but a different way and uh i think that's that's one of the elements that can reignite you as well like uh, when you already did action like acting for for a little bit and then at some point you actually feel that you're kind of losing a little bit like of an interest or spark i think reigniting the spark is is people who do the same thing That's and right. their passion and like people around you who are just like so talented and you're like i can't do nothing of that shit but you are so good <laughs> yeah it makes you want to try or like you realize like man i you know i had there was i had this experience when i was, I was on stage one time and i was like god dude like i was with these actors who were so good you know and i finally got the courage to tell one of the guys that and i was like man, you guys are just so good. I'm just so happy to, to like be able to be here and watch you work. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he was kind of a fancy guy. And he like leaned over and he was like, Hey man, we're working the same gig, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think that's important. You know, when you see those people who are so good and you're in the room with them, be like, motherfucker, I'm in the room with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're working the same gig, even if it's the same class or the same community yeah. theater show or uh, or the same video game that you're doing the voiceover for for free, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're working the same gig. Nice. You're that good that, too. That's actually yeah. a pretty, pretty good way of thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. Nice. We're working the same gig. I've told that to a couple <laughs> of uh, younger actors and yeah. it blew their mind. Yeah. I didn't tell them that I stole it from someone else. Are you a gamer? No. No. But I do have a Switch and I bring it with me. Uh, overseas yeah <laughs> but, but my switch is basically an elaborate mario kart machine that's all basically right, yeah, yeah. all i play yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so i'm guessing have you seen the, the fallout series i've just binged it i was up until like yeah. four in the morning yeah yeah <laughs> I, totally I really did. liked it i think it's so good yeah i thought it was great like um the world that they make is really cool but honestly the writing is really yeah. wonderful like the different plots that they have like all feel fleshed out mm -hmm. they all feel like um like none of them are sort of throwaways or i i thought it was just a, a great show what did you think uh, first of all i played almost all fallout yeah. games since the, the very beginning like the first and second one i played those like back in the days when i was like 17 i think Whoa. so uh, uh the new ones fallout 3 fallout new vegas fallout 4 i played all of them so the world for me is very familiar yeah I didn't like the first episode. When I watched the first okay. episode, I was like, yeah, this, I don't care about any of those people. And like, because there, there are like three, three lines, right. you know, so you can like, eh. but then with second, third, fourth, like it just became yeah. so much better. It's like, it, I think it's, it's very good. And like, it really captures the actual world of Fallout, like the games, yeah, because it's cool. absurd, like the, the, the corporations who were using people like just for our, all these experiments and all this stuff. And just this violent world, like a lot of, you know, gore and <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. it right good. on, man. All right. Look, Blitz round. Blitz round. Here we go. I'm ready. Quick questions, quick answers, okay. no points, no prize. No point. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm ready. Uh, texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Cats. Your one guilty pleasure? I don't have a guilty pleasure. Oh. I uh, am not ashamed of any of them. Nice. You know, that's that's <laughs> personal growth, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what makes you laugh? Uh, I think... Ooh, uh, uh, the dumb animal videos, man. I love them so much. And like, I know that I should be some sort of like sophisticated com comedic sense kind mm -hmm. of person because, you know, we're, we're in showbiz and mm -hmm. we've been around a lot of comedy before, but no, it's dumb animal videos. Nice. Yeah. And what makes you angry? Uh, I think the outrage for outrage, uh, outrage for outrage sake. That makes me really mad. That's sort of what I'm, what I'm most angry about these days. Mm -hmm. And that's what the internet is made of. Oh, unfortunately. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. It's, it's their, their only right opinions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any nicknames? In college, I went by Razor Fist. I didn't give myself that name. It was a joke that someone said one time and it stuck. So then for the entire four years of college, people thought that I was some like cage fighting murderer, uh, yeah. which is not the truth. I'm a delicate <laughs> little art flower, but, uh, but that was a nickname I had. Yeah. All right. Uh, what dish do you cook best? I have been making 
salmon a lot lately. Mm. It's not that I cook it best, but I've been making it a lot lately and I find it to be delicious. Nice, I agree with you. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, like book, screen, video game? So I also just watched, so I have lots of favorite characters, mm. but I've been really thinking about Okay, so I have plenty of favorite characters from like, you know, fancy media like Shakespeare mm -hmm. and stuff. But I've been thinking a lot about Apocalypse from X-Men and mm -hmm. the Shadow King from X-Men because I just watched Legion, <laughs> yeah. which is this sort of superhero story that was on FX a few years back. I think I love that. It's yeah. so incredibly fantastically weird. Yeah. I loved it so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it just made me think when I was a kid, I was really into X-Men. And I kept thinking that um, they were pointing to these different stories, you know, either like Age of Apocalypse or something like that. Um, they weren't really, I don't think they resolved it before mm -hmm. any of that stuff happened. But I just kept thinking about the Shadow King and Age of Apocalypse. Like the last, so I watched it over the course of like the last three weeks or something. Yeah. So for the last three weeks, I've been like, I should go out and get another Age of Apocalypse comic. And I haven't bought like a, a comic like that in decades, yeah. but like I'm thinking about <laughs> yeah. it a lot. So right now, my yeah. favorite character is, I guess, Apocalypse or the Shadow yeah. King from X-Men. I love that show. Honestly, I think that show, I think it's just amazing. It's yeah, just it's like really you, you, you're you watching it like, what the fuck is going on? I don't yeah. understand, but I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. great, man. Really good. Uh, all right. Um, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Ooh, it's, that's a close, but it's got to be Star Wars. Star Wars or Star Trek? God, it's got to be Star Wars again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? No, I no, I, I don't. I I do like to impress children. I can juggle two balls with one hand. That is that counts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I think I learned it in acting school. So I think a lot of people mm -hmm. who have like you know they'll have weird skills like trapeze or whatever. Because mm -hmm. I had to take a course in it. You know, when they were in <laughs> acting school. Um, uh, I I feel like. I need a weird skill though. I need to I need to find out if I'm double jointed or something. <laughs> All right. How often do you cry? I never used to cry at all. Mm -hmm. Like I probably went 15 years with never crying, which is bonkers. Mm -hmm. Um and now I probably cry maybe three times a year. Mm. But I feel like that's increasing with mm -hmm. frequency as I kind of get more in touch with myself yeah. and the world around me. But for a long time, I had such a stifled or arrested emotional development mm. that uh, that wasn't an option that was available to me. So I always hated people say, like, oh, release it. Like, mm. fucking what? I don't know. I'm just supposed to like okay, now it's time to cry yeah. and I'll be better. Like, I did not understand that yeah, at all. I, I still don't understand. Like, I mean, it, if it hits me, it hits me. But like, if it doesn't, what do you mean release? Release what? I don't feel any pressure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how can people reach you if they want to work with you? Agents. Mary Collins Agency uh, okay. in Dallas, Texas. That would be the best way. Okay. Uh, you will have uh, it in the description to this episode and on screen. Oh, nice. We have a segment on the show that's called One Cool Think. It's something that you really like, that you think our viewers should try to. You know what I will recommend? This is this is uh, maybe something that seems stupid here in, in, uh, in the UK. Try me. But keep in mind, I'm an American. I recently, <laughs> I recently started drinking tea, and you guys are on to something. <laughs> That's actually really fun because as Ted Lasso said, like it's just brown water. <laughs> yeah, like brown water. That's yeah. what I thought at yeah. first. Yeah. I had such a great cup of tea the other day. Yeah. It was this tea that had like Szechuan pepper in mm -hmm. it, which is. That that kind of pepper like makes your tongue tingle and it doesn't exactly yeah. taste like pepper. Yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. the weirdest thing, and I was just so smitten with it. I thought it was, and I was like, maybe that'll be my hobby. Maybe I'll be a tea maker. Maybe I'll go and collect herbs and dry and I mean, stick. Luke, like you can you can do it in so many like so so many different ways. Like, right, there's a whole yeah. tradition in China, for example, for like you know tea tea Medicine, ceremony. Yeah. Right, you have ceremonies. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna be a tea master. No, I'm not gonna be a tea master. But that is actually what I've been. 
interested in these days. Nice. Is so tea. your one cool thing yeah. is tea. You guys try it because honestly, I <laughs> no. To be fair, I gotta I gotta say I'm not a tea person. Like I can do like I can drink some tea sometimes, but like I'm more more into coffee. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a coffee with man. coffee before you go to sleep. You don't go to sleep after. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Look, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for being honest and open about everything. And thank you for giving me your time. And I really am looking forward to in uh, uh, my call time is in 50 minutes. Your call time is in one hour, 50 yeah. minutes. Yeah. I'll see you on set in, in in a few hours. I can't wait. I think we're doing our scene tomorrow. The our scene scene, tomorrow. Yeah. I can't wait to work with you again. That'll be fun. And man. I hope that maybe in your time in season seven, who knows, maybe Volkov will appear again. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe my absolutely. character will be there again. Absolutely. And maybe we'll do another one. All right. Uh, and it was a pleasure, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. If you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, or don't. It's your decision. <laughs> uh, bye. Bye-bye.